start by doing a quick pop culture quiz here. Don't worry, it's not past fit. But I do wanna, I do wanna ask you to, to respond by raising your hand. How many of you have heard of Ray Rice? If you've heard of Ray Rice, raise your hand. Okay. Many of you have. So the Ray Rice story goes something like this. He is a professional football player. He's a star running back for the Baltimore Ravens. He's kind of the face of the franchise. He's been there for six years. In February, Rice was um, uh, uh, arrested for assaulting his fiance. Uh, he admitted fairly readily that um, he had struck her, and the, even the police report uh, tells about how he rendered her unconscious. Now, what's happened since that moment has been a series of twists and turns about which um, people have all kinds of opinions and all kinds of commentary. But I want to just sort of focus on Ray Rice's actions. So the media was following the case with a fair degree of interest <coughs> until September 8th. And that's when things really blew up. Because that's when um, TMZ, the, the bastion of journalism as we all know, <laughs> that's when TMZ released a video of the event. And so there was a horrific living color, the, the, the scene of the two of them quarreling, and then Rice punching her once in the face, snapping her head back. She hits her on the back of the elevator and is knocked out cold. It's horrific. It's a horrible, chilling scene to see that kind of violence. Make no mistake about it. So, the, the, the reason the media has been all whipped into a frenzy besides that violence is because of how badly the NFL has handled it. And, and frankly, from, from the Baltimore Ravens to the NFL to the New Jersey Superior Court, all kinds of institutions have bungled this case. They really can. Uh, but, but here's the thing. Rice, as soon as the video was released, not only he was convicted, but as soon as the video was released, Rice was cut from the Baltimore Ravens, and Rice was banned from the NFL for an indefinite period of time, essentially for the rest of his career. Okay? And while there was all kinds of opinions about who came to what, when, and, and all of that, there was one thing for which everyone agreed, and that was that he should never, ever be allowed to play football again. And this was a violent man who had done a despicable thing, and everyone agreed the consensus was universal. He should never be allowed to step foot on a football field again. I only heard one person once on a radio talk show that I listen to from time to time. Let's be clear, I listen to NPR as well, but occasionally sports radio. So I only heard one person dare say, well, wait a second, this might be, um, this might be a little extreme, if not unfair, and the like. And of course, the, the talk show DJ just, just they blew him up. I mean, they just said that's the most ridiculous thing, and all the calls that came after that sort of, sort of lambasted the caller who would make such a suggestion, right? Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I have to say, I, I much was put it in the same place as the sort of consensus opinion. It's just horrible when it's done. And, and I'm, as a football fan, I'm embarrassed that their initial response was to just give them a two-game suspension. That was their initial response. It's just horrible what it's done. But, but here's the question I want to ask you. As, as we listen to Dr. Jonah and his story, What's the difference between our sense of certainty that he should be punished and banned for the rest of his life and Jonah's righteous anger, about which we find totally comical 
and which renders him one of the Latin tops of all of Scripture. Just think about that question for a minute. What's the thing? Alright. If you don't know the book of Jonah, you are missing the funniest book in all of Scripture. I'm telling you, it is a riot. We don't say that often about Bible stories, but this one is. It's short, it's sweet, it's a story in six scenes, and I've got to give you a summary because you're not going to believe me when I tell you. So, scene one, scene one, God calls Jonah and says, Jonah, why don't you go to Nineveh, and I want you to tell them that they are in trouble. I want you to tell them that I'm aware of their wicked ways, and their life is about to come to an end. God commands, we hear, that's the word, God commands Jonah to do that. And Jonah turns and runs in the opposite direction. He gets on the first boat to China, otherwise known as Tarshish in this particular story. He gets on the first boat to Tarshish. I'm not doing that, he's thinking. End of scene one. Scene two, God sees that Jonah has gotten on the boat, and so God whips up the wind and the waters, and they're crashing on the boat, and the, and the sailors of the boat are like, whoa, oh, what is going on? Our boat's going to break. They're desperate to do something. They throw all the cargo overboard, hoping to save the boat, but the wind is still threatening the boat. And then they're like, well, what is this about? Why are we so cursed? And so they, they try to figure out who to blame. And eventually they realize, wait a second, it's you, it's Jonah. So they come to Jonah and they say, what have you done to anger the God so much? And Jonah says, oh, maybe I'm running from God. I'm not saying, but maybe God gave me a commandment and I went the other way. Maybe God wanted me to, you know, deliver this message and I'm not Maybe. Well, these sailors, they may be pagans, but they're not stupid. They throw them over. Right? And the water's calm right away. Now God's watching all of this. And so God, who, who you know, cares actually about Jonah, God sends um, a fish, a large fish, to swallow Jonah up. Okay? I don't know, there's no picture, but that's the story. Right? A right, large fish to swallow Jonah up. End of scene two. Okay? Scene three, Jonah's in the belly of a large fish. It says for three days and three nights. Now, I don't know about you, but if you're sitting in the belly of a large fish, I'd be doing some soul searching, you know? And so Jonah's doing that, and Jonah comes to realize, you know, God, you say, here I was in these stormy waters, and you drowned, but you sent this fish, and, 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 and as we were wont to do when we're in a tight situation, we're in the belly of a fish. Um, God uh, and Jonah, Jonah starts to make a deal with God. Get me out of this, get me safe. And, uh, okay, I'll do whatever you ask. I promise I will. And so God hears Jonah's plea and he commands the fish, again, that word command. He commands the fish to spit Jonah out on dry land. And so, there goes Jonah. Okay. <laughs> so, Jonah's now on dry land. Scene four. God comes to Jonah and says, so, those people in Nineveh, go to them and tell them that they have sinned against me, that they have committed atrocities, and that I will come in judgment on them. This time, Jonah does what God commanded him to do. Scene 5, Jonah goes to Nineveh. And he says, all right, gang, I am here to tell you that God has seen what you have done, and you have 40 days, and then you're done. And then God is coming for you, and your time is over. And it's interesting here to know that as a prophet, most of the times when they come to these villages, they call for repentance. Jonah never says a word about repentance. He only renders judgment. And I can't imagine he's doing it kind of with great glee. Aha, 40 days and then you're toast. <laughs> well, the Ninevites, they may be pagans, but they catch on. And the king of Nineveh proclaims a time of fast for all the village. It's so funny. They mentioned fasting for the humans and the animals, right? Because if the humans were going to eat, the animals shouldn't eat either, I guess. So, so a fasting for all the village, no eating, and they're all full. They wear in sackcloth, and they begin to weep, and they begin to pray, and they begin to beat their chest, and they repent. And you know what happens next? God is watching this, and God's like, wow, you go to the lights, okay? You know what? I'm going to spare you. I'm not going to destroy you after all. And 
Jonah is mad. Jonah is ripped. He is ripped. He's like, I knew it. I knew you were going to do this. And he has a little prophetic temper tantrum, is what happens. And he goes storming out of the city to so many. He's like, I knew, I knew you were going to do this. This is why I didn't want to give the message in the first place, because I knew that you were a gracious God, slow to anger, patient, forgiving, merciful. I'm not making this up. It's in the scripture. I knew that you were going to do this. And then he says, you know what? Just, just kill me. Just shoot me now and I'll be dead. It's not pretty when anyone has a temper tantrum, much less problems, right? So he's going down out of the building. And he sets up a tent. Just on the edge of the village, overlooking the village. Yeah. And you're seeing five. Scene six. This is where we come in. This is the story that we heard today. Jonah's sitting on the tent, overlooking the village. And, you know, it kind of makes me wonder um, so, why is he still hanging out around the village? Is it because he wants to see? Maybe he's hoping that God will change God's mind and actually wipe out the village after all, you know? Or, or, or maybe, or maybe who would be even better if he catches the Ninevites sort of returning to their old wicked ways and then Jonah can kind of enjoy a, a great sort of cosmic, I told you so, right? Why is he on the edge of the village? We don't know. But he's watching. God's watching too. And so the first thing that God does is, is God has a bush cover Jonah and provide his shame from the heat so that's sitting there sulking out of it. And, and the prophet, what's happening with his shady bush? Well, then the next day, God commands, and, and again, we often use that word command, God commands a worm to go and eat the bush. Now, it's interesting. The word commands is times in the scripture uh, in this story. One Jonah who does just the opposite. The other two animals, a fish and a worm, who obey God. Hmm. Paradigm of obedience the animals are, right? The worm eats the bush and you know what? Jonah who's feeling entitled to this shape has another type of tantrum and Jonah says, fine, fine, just shoot me, kill me. Really, really, I don't want to live anymore. Just kill me now. And God's like, Jonah can just get a moment of insight, can just understand God's care and concern and compassion. And God says, no, wait a second, wait a second, Jonah. So you are angry about this bush for which you didn't labor at all, which you had for only one day. And you're angry that this bush died. How do you think I feel about the city of Nineveh? How much do you think I care about the city of Nineveh that has 120,000 people? Do you not think that I can? <coughs> and that's where the story ends. Do you not think that I can? John is a stitch. He really is. Read it for yourself and you'll see. We should laugh. It's good that we laugh at John. But I want to give us this warning. All of us, you and me alike. When you're laughing at John, be careful. Because you know what? You're also laughing at yourself. We're also laughing at ourselves. Because you see, this, this book of Jonah, it says so much about human nature and about our struggles with God's way of grace and patience and forgiveness. We love the gracious God who forgives us. We love the God who's patient with us. Jonah loved the God who sent a fish to pluck Jonah out of the, the stormy waters, even after Jonah had tried to ditch God, you know. Jonah loved the God who provided a bush to give God shade, to give Jonah shade, you know, even though Jonah didn't deserve it, Jonah had, had had a temper tantrum. Jonah loved that God. But as soon as God gives the Ninevites a second chance, Jonah's outrage. He's indignant. He doesn't want that kind of grace for those kind of people. Do you see? Jonah, you, me, us, we, sometimes we seem more committed to our sense of, 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 of righteous anger 
than we do to the possibility of grace. More committed to having um, our enemies remain villainous than we do to the possibility that they might repent and have a change of heart. We'd rather that they remain villainous, because then we can enjoy that hatred and that, that anger that we have towards them. And then the repent just muddies the water so much. And for God, we have never seen so long. Now, I, I don't know about you, I'm judge for you, but I'll say this about me. I think I'm a pretty good Christian, you know? I'm trying. Um, and, and actually, I do know about most of you, and I think, I think this church, we, we have good Christians here, and, and by that I mean, look, we care about the poor, we try to feed the people of hunger, we're good to one another, we, we mostly celebrate the gospel with, with grateful hearts. But what about the time, or the times, when, when what Jesus commands us to do breaks our conscience. <clears throat> what about when, when, when it creates tension between what we want and feel in our guts and what God wants from our hearts? What about those times when the grace and the light and the forgiveness of God tries to get into the darkest and coldest corners of our hearts and we don't want it to get there? Because we want that darkness to stay. <laughs> then, I'm not sure that we're much different from Jonah. Stuck with our righteous anger, you know? So this Ray Rice case, I mean, what he did was horrible. It was Shocking to see. Don't for a moment misunderstand me. You think I'm making light of domestic violence? Don't for a moment misunderstand me and think that 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 this woman should sort of welcome him back with open arms. Although I gotta tell you, in case you don't know this part of the story, she married him a month after their their event, and she continues to sort of stand by him and and, and it's, I'm sure the relationship is complicated. But don't for a moment think that when I wonder out loud with you about, about forgiveness and about grace and about repentance and amendment of life, I'm suggesting, well, she should just go all back to him, or anyone who's been the victim of abuse should go back to their abuser. I'm not saying that. And I want to be clear about that because, frankly, I've heard as a pastor too many stories of women who have been counseled by their pastors using the scripture to go back to their abuser. I am not saying that at all. Not at all. <coughs> but I am saying that we are here in this particular place, on this particular day, you and I, to hear the scriptures. And so I am saying that, that, that before we walk out of here, we should ask ourselves, so what does Jonah and what does God have to say as horrible as the way I saw We should lose our sleep in those terms. The last verse of Jonah has God speaking to Jonah and saying, shouldn't I care? Shouldn't I care? Now to our ears, that's a, a rhetorical question with an obvious answer. I think the only question that remains unanswered is for Jonah and for you and for me, and that is, do we have the faith 